Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode where I just read you a source from the ancient world because it's fun and nice and it makes both of us happy. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I'm your host, the woman who loves one Roman writer, and his name is Ovid. My name is Liv, though. So yeah, here I am once again with a reading of Ovid's Metamorphoses because it's fucking fun and I love it and the source generally is just so good and nice and that you all need to hear it in the flesh, for real. Of course, I am still here with this old and stuffy translation because copyright law, but all the same, it's still Ovid and thus still great. Before we dive in, though, I just want to let you all know that once again, I'll be doing a New Year Q&A episode. Last year, you all had some awesome questions and I really enjoyed answering them, so I'm excited to be doing it again. That episode will air on the first Friday in January, so make sure you ask your questions before like the end of the year or really, really early January so that I have a chance to answer them. You can send in your questions at mythsbaby.com slash questions. There is a, a form there and there's a link to that form in this episode description. Today we're diving in to book four of Ovid's Metamorphoses. We've talked about the cursed family of Thebes, though some of them will return soon enough. But in book four, we're starting off uh, with a real bang. Because, well, you'll see. This is Ovid's Metamorphoses, translated by Brooks Moore, Book 4, Part 1. Alkithoe, daughter of King Minias, consents not to the orgies of the god, denies that Bacchus is the son of Jove, and her two sisters join her in that crime. Twas festival day when matrons and their maids, keeping it sacred, had forbade all toil. And having draped their bosoms with wild skins, they loosed their long hair for the sacred wreaths, and took the leafy thyrsus in their hands. For so the priest commanded them. Austere the wrath of Bacchus if his power be scorned. Mothers and youthful brides obeyed the priest, and putting by their wickers and their webs, dropped their unfinished toils to offer up frankincense to the god, invoking him with many names. O Bacchus, O twice-born, O fire begot, you only child twice mothered, God of all those who plant the luscious grape, O Liber, all these names and many more for ages known throughout the lands of Greece. Your youth is not consumed by wasting time, and O oh, you are an ever-youthful boy, most beautiful of all the gods of heaven, smooth as a virgin when your horns are hid, the distant east to tawny India's clime, where rolls remotest Ganges to the sea, was conquered by your might. O oh, most revered, you did destroy the doubting Pentheus, and hurled the sailors' bodies into the deep, and smote Lycurgus, wielder of the axe. And you do give your lynxes, double-yoked with showy harness. Satyrs follow you, and Bacchanals, and old Silenus, drunk, unsteady on his staff, jolting so roughly on his small back bent ass, and all the way resounds a youthful clamor, and the screams of women, and the noise of tambourines, and the hollow cymbals, and the boxwood flutes fitted with measured holes. You are implored by all Ismenian women to appear peaceful and mild, and they perform your rites. Only the daughters of King Minias are carding wool within their fastened doors, or twisting with their thumbs the fleecy yarn, or working at the web. So they corrupt the sacred festival with needless toil, keeping their handmaids busy at the work. And one of them, while drawing out the thread with nimble thumb, anon began to speak. While others loiter and frequent these rites fantastic, we the wards of Pallas, much to be preferred, by speaking novel thoughts may lighten labor. 
Let us each in turn relate an attentive audience, a novel tale, and so the hours may glide. It pleased her sisters, and they ordered her to tell the story that she loved the most. So, as she counted in her well-stored mind the many tales she knew, first doubted she whether to tell the tale of Durketto, the Babylonian, who, ever the tribes of Palestine in limpid ponds yet lives. Her body changed and scales upon her limbs, or how her daughter, having taken wings, passed her declining years in whitened towers. Or should she tell of Nias, who with herbs too potent into fishes had transformed the bodies of her lovers, till she met herself the same sad fate? Or of that tree which sometimes bore white fruit and now is changed and darkened by the blood that stained its roots? Pleased with the novelty of this, at once she tells the tale of Pyramus and Thisbe, and swiftly, as told it unto them, the fleecy wool was twisted into threads. When Pyramus and Thisbe, who were known the one most handsome of all youthful men, the other loveliest of all eastern girls, lived in adjoining houses, near the walls that Queen Semiramis had built of brick around her famous city. They grew fond and loved each other, meeting often there, and as the days went by their love increased. They wished to join in marriage, but that joy their fathers had forbidden them to hope. And yet the passion that with equal strength inflamed their minds, no parents could forbid. No relatives had guessed their secret love, for all their converse was by nods and signs. And as a smoldering fire may gather heat, the more it smothered, so their love increased. Now it so happened a partition built between their houses many years ago was made defective with a little chink, a small defect observed by none, although for ages there. But what is hid from love? Our lovers found the secret opening and used the passage to convey the sounds of gentle murmured words whose tuneful note passed oft in safety through that hidden way. There many a time they stood on either side, Thisbe on one and Pyramus the other, and when their warm breath touched from lip to lip, their sighs were such as this. You envious wall, why are you standing in the way of those who die for love? What harm could happen that you should permit us to enjoy our love? But if we ask too much, let us persuade that you will open while we kiss but once. For we are not ungrateful. Unto you we owe our debt. But here you have left a way that breathed words may enter loving ears. So vainly whispered they, and when the night began to darken they exchanged farewells, made presents that they kissed a fond farewell, vain kisses, that to love might none avail. When dawn removed the glimmering lamps of night, and the bright sun had dried the dewy grass again, they met where they had told their love, and now complaining of their hapless fate, in murmurs gentle, they at last resolved a way to slip upon that quiet night, elude their parents, and as soon as they are free, quit the great builded city and their homes. Fearful to wander in the pathless fields, they chose a trysting place, the tomb of Ninus, where safely they might hide unseen beneath the shadow of a tall mulberry tree, covered with snow-white fruit, close by a spring. All is arranged according to their hopes, and now the daylight seeming slowly moved sinks into the deep waves, and the tardy night arises from the spot where day declines. Quickly the clever Thisbe, having first deceived her parents, opened the closed door. She flitted in the silent night away, and having veiled her face, reached the great tomb and sat beneath the tree. Love made her bold. There, as she waited, a great lioness approached the nearby spring to quench her thirst, her frothing jaws covered with blood of slaughtered oxen. As the moon was bright, Thisbe could see her, and affrighted fled with trembling footstep to a gloomy cave, 
and as she ran, she slipped and dropped her veil, which fluttered to the ground. She did not dare save it. Wherefore, when the savage beast had taken a great drink and quenched her thirst, and then had turned to seek her forest lair, she found it on her way, and full of rage tore it and stained it with her bloody jaws. But Thisbe, fortunate, escaped unseen. Now Pyramus had not gone out so soon after Thisbe as to the tryst, and when he saw the certain traces of that savage beast imprinted in the yielding dust, his face went white with fear. But when he found the veil covered with blood, he cried, Oh, one night has caused the ruin of two lovers. You were most deserving of completed days, but as for me, my heart is guilty. I destroyed you, oh, my love. I asked you to come out in the dark night to a lonely haunt and failed to go before. Oh, whatever lurks beneath this rock, though ravenous lion, tear my guilty flesh and with most cruel jaws devour my cursed entrails. What? Not so. It is a craven part to wish for death. So he stopped briefly and took up the veil, went straightway to the shadow of the tree, and as his tears bedewed the well-known veil, he kissed it and sighed and said, Kisses and tears are yours. Receive my blood as well. And he imbued the steel, girt at his side, deep in his bowels, and plucked it from the wound, a faint with death. As he fell back to earth, his spurting blood shot upward in the air, so that when decay has rift a leaden pipe, a hissing jet of water spurts on high. But that dark tide, the berries on the tree, assumed a deeper tint. For as the roots soaked up the blood, the pendant mulberries were dyed a purple hue. Thisbe returned, though trembling still with fright, for now she thought her lover must await her at the tree, and she should hasten before he feared for her. Longing to tell him of her great escape, she sadly looked for him with faithful eyes. But when she saw the spot and the changed tree, she doubted, could they be the same, for so the color of the hanging fruit deceived. While doubt dismayed her, on the ground she saw the wounded body covered with its blood. She started backwards, and her face grew pale and ashen, and she shuddered like the sea, which trembles when its face is lightly skimmed by the chill breezes. And she paused a space, but when she knew it was the one she loved, she struck her tender breast and tore her hair, then, wreathing in her arms his loved form, she bathed the wound with tears, mingling her grief in his unquenched blood, and as she kissed his death-cold features, wailed, Ah, Pyramus, what cruel fate has taken your life away? Pyramus, Pyramus, awake, awake, it is your dearest Thisbe that calls you. Lift your drooping head, alas. At Thisbe's name he raised his eyes, though languorous in death, and darkness gathered round him as he gazed. And then she saw her veil, and near it lay his ivory sheath, but not the trusty sword, and once again she wailed. Your own right hand and your great passion have destroyed you, and I, my hand shall be as bold as yours, my love shall nerve me to the fatal deed. You I will follow to eternity, though I be censured for the wretched cause, so surely I shall share your wretched fate. Oh, whom death could me alone bereave, you shall not from my love be reft by death. Oh, your wretched parents, mine and his, let our misfortunes and our pleadings melt your hearts, that you no more deny to those whom constant love and lasting death unite. Entomb us in a single sepulchre, and, oh, this tree of many branching boughs, spreading dark shadows on the corpse of one, destined to cover two. Take our fate upon your head, mourn our untimely deaths, let your fruit darken for a memory, an emblem of our blood. No more, she said, and having fixed the point below her breast, she fell on the keen sword, still warm with his red blood. But though her death was out of nature's law, her prayer was answered, for it moved the gods and moved their parents. 
Now the gods have changed the ripened fruit which darkens on the branch, and from the funeral pile their parents sealed their gathered ashes in a single urn. So ended she. At once Lakonoe took the narrator's thread, and as she spoke her sisters all were silent. Even the sun that rules the world was captive made of love. My theme shall be a love song of the sun. Tis said the lord of the day, whose wakeful eye beholds at once whatever may transpire, witnessed the loves of Mars and Venus. Grieved to know the wrong, he called the son of Juno, Vulcan, and gave full knowledge of the deed, showing how Mars and Venus shamed his love, and they defiled his bed. Vulcan amazed, the nimble-thoughted Vulcan lost his wits, so that he dropped the work his right hand held. But turning from all else, at once he set to file out chains of brass, delicate, fine, from which to fashion nets invisible, filmy of mesh and airy as the thread of insect web, and that from the rafter swings, implicit woven that they yielded soft the slightest movements or the gentlest touch. With cunning skill he drew them round the bed where they were sure to dally. Presently appeared the faithless wife, and on the couch lay down to languish with her paramour. Meshed in the chains, they could not thence arise, nor could they else but lie in strict embrace. <sighs> Cunningly thus entrapped by Vulcan's wit. At once the Lemnian cuckold opened wide the folding ivory doors and called the gods to witness. There they lay disgraced and bound. Oh, what were many of the lighter gods who wished themselves in like disgraceful bonds. The gods were moved to laughter, and the tale was long most noted in the courts of heaven. The Catharian Venus brooded on the sun's betrayal of her stolen joys, and thought to torture him in passion's pains, and wreak requital for the pain he caused. Son of Hyperion, what avails your light? What is the profit of your glowing heat? O oh, you whose flames have parched innumerous lands, yourself are burning with another flame, and you whose orb should joy the universe are gazing only on Leucothea's charms. Your glorious eye on the one fair maid is fixed, forgetting all besides. Too early you are rising from the bed of Orient skies, too late you are setting in the western waves, so taking time to gaze upon your love. Your frenzy lengthens out the wintry hour, and often you are darkened in eclipse, dark shadows of this trouble in your mind, unwanted aspect, casting man perplexed in abject terror. Pale you are, though not between you and the earth the shadowous moon bedims thy devious way. Your passion gives to grief your countenance, for her your heart alone is grieving. Clymene and Rhodos, and Persa, mother of deluding Circe, and all forgotten for your doting hope, even Clytie, who is yearning for your love. No more can charm you, you are so foredone. Leucothea is the cause of many tears. Leucothea, daughter of your enemy, most beauteous matron of Arabia's strand, where spicy odors blow. Your enemy in youthful prime excelled her mother's grace, and, save her daughter, all excelled besides. Leucothea's father, Orcamus, was king where Achaemenes' Willem held their sway, and Orcamus from ancient Belus' death might count his reign the seventh in descent. The dark night pastures of Apollo's steeds are hid below the western sky. When there and spent with toil in lieu of nibbling herbs, they take ambrosial food. It gives their limbs restoring strength and nourishes anew. Now, while these coursers eat celestial food and night resumes his reign, the god appears disguised, unguessed as old Eurynome to fair Leucothea as she draws the threads, all smoothly twisted from her spindle. 
There she sits with twice six handmaids ranged around, and as the god beholds her at the door, he kisses her, as if a child beloved and he her mother. And he spoke to her, Let your twelve handmaids leave us undisturbed, for I have things of close import to tell, and, seemly, from a mother to her child. So when they all withdrew, the god began, Oh, I am he who measures the long year, I see all things, and through me the wide world may see all things. I am the glowing eye of the broad universe, you are to me the glory of the earth. Filled with alarm from her relaxed fingers, she let fall the distaff and the spindle. But her fear so lovely in her beauty seemed, the god no longer brooked delay. He changed his form back to his wonted beauty and resumed his bright celestial. Startled at the sight, the maid recoiled a space, but presently the glory of the god inspired her love, and all her timid doubts dissolved away. Without complaint, she melted in his arms. So ardently the bright Apollo loved, that Clytie, envious of Leucothea's joy, where evil none was known, a scandal made. And having published wide their secret love, Leucothea's father also heard the tale. Relentlessly and fierce, his cruel hand buried his living daughter in the ground, who, while her arms implored the glowing sun, complained, For love of you my life is lost. And as she wailed, her father sowed her there. Hyperion's son began with piercing heat to scatter the loose sand, a way to open, that she might look with beauteous features forth too late. For smothered by the compact earth, you cannot lift your drooping head, alas! A lifeless corpse remains, no sadder sight since Phaethon was blasted by the bolt, down hurled by Jove, had ever grieved the god who daily drives his winged steeds. In vain he strives with all the magic of his rays to warm her limbs anew. The deed is done. What vantage gives his might if fate deny? He sprinkles fragrant nectar on her grave and lifeless corpse, and as he wails, exclaims, But naught shall hinder you to reach the skies. At once the maiden's body, steeped in dews of nectar, sweet and odorate, dissolves and adds its fragrant juices to the earth. Slowly from this a spout of frankincense takes root-enriched soil, and bursting through the sandy hillock shows its top. No more to Clytie comes the author of Sweet Light, for though her love might make excuse of grief, and grief may plead to pardon jealous words, his heart disdains the schemest of his woe, and she who turned the sour the sweet of love from that unhallowed moment pined away. Envious and hating all her sister nymphs day after day, and through the lonely nights all unprotected from the chilly breeze, her hair disheveled, tangled, unadorned, she sat unmoved upon the bare hard ground. Nine days the nymph was nourished by the dews, or haply by her own tears bitter brine. All other nourishment was not to her. She never raised herself from the bare ground, though on the god her gaze was ever fixed. She turned her features towards him as he moved. They say that after a while her limbs took root and fastened to the ground. A pearly white overspread her countenance that turned as pale and bloodless as the dead. But here and there a blushing tinge resolved in violet tint, and something like the blossom of that name a flower concealed her face. Although a root now holds her fast to earth, the heliotrope turns ever to the sun, as if to prove that all may change and love through all remain. Thus was the story ended. All were charmed to hear recounted such mysterious deeds. While some were doubting whether such were true, others affirmed that to the living gods is nothing to restrain their wondrous works. Though surely of the gods immortal, none accorded Bacchus even thought or place. When all had made an end of argument, they bade Alkithui take up the word. She, busily working on the pendant web, still shot the shuttle through the warp and said, The amours of the shepherd Daphnis, known to many of you, I shall now relate. The shepherd Daphnis of Mount Ida, who was turned to stone obdurate for the nymph whose love he slighted, so the rivalry of love neglected rouses to revenge. 
Neither shall I relate the story told of Skithon, double-sexed, who first was man, then altered to a woman. So I pass the tale of Kelmis, turned to adamant, who reared almighty Jove from tender youth. So likewise the Curates, whom the rain brought forth to life. Smilax and Crocus, too, transpitiated into little flowers. All these I pass, to tell a novel tale, which haply may resolve in pleasant thoughts. Learn how the fountain Salmachus became so infamous. Learn how it enervates and softens the limbs of those who chance to bathe. Although the fountain's properties are known, the cause is yet unknown. The naiads nursed an infant son of Hermes, surely his of Aphrodite gotten in the caves of Ida. For the child resembled both the god and goddess, and his name was theirs. The years passed by, and when the boy had reached the limit of three lustrums, he forsook his native mountains, for he loved to roam through unimagined places, by the banks of undiscovered rivers, and the joy of finding wonders made his labor light. Leaving Mount Ida, where his youth was spent, he reached the land of Lycia, and from thence the verge of Caria, where a pretty pool of soft, translucent water may be seen. So clear the glistening bottom glads the eye, no barren sedge, no fenny reeds annoy, no rushes with their sharpened arrow points, but all around the edges of that pool the softest grass engirdles with its green. A nymph dwells there, unsuited to the chase, unskilled to bend the bow, slothful of foot, the only naiad in the world unknown to rapid-running Diana. Whensoever her naiad sisters pled in winged words, take up the javelin, sister Salmachus, take up the painted quiver and unite your leisure with the action of the chase. She only scorned the javelin and the quiver, nor joined her leisure to the active chase. Rather, she bathes her smooth and shapely limbs, or combs her tresses with the boxwood comb Catorian or looking in the pool consults the glassed waters of effects increasing beauty, or she decks herself in gauzy raiment and reposing lulls on cushioned leaves, or grass in verdured beds, or gathers posies from the spangled lawns. Now, haply as she culled the sweetest flowers, she saw the youth, and longing in her heart made havoc as her greedy eyes beheld. Although her love could scarcely brook delay, she waited to enhance her loveliness, in beauty hoping to allure her love. All richly dight she scanned herself and robes, to know that every charm should fair appear, and she be worthy wherefore she began. O oh, godlike youth, if you are of the skies, you are no other than the god of love. If mortal, blessed are they who gave you birth. Happy your brother, happy fortunate your sister, happy fortunate and blessed the nurse who gave her bosom. But the joys surpassing all, dearest and tenderest, are hers, whom you shall wed. So let it be if you so young have deigned to marry, let my joys be stolen. If unmarried, join with me in wedlock. So she spoke and stood in silence, waiting for the youth's reply. He knows nor cares for love. With loveliness the mounting blushes tinge his youthful cheeks, as blush-red tint of apples on the tree, ripe in the summer sun, or as the hue of painted ivory, or the round moon red blushing in her splendor, when the clash of brass resounds in vain. And long the nymph implored, almost clung on his neck as smooth and white as ivory, unceasingly imploring him to kiss her, though as chaste as kisses to a sister, but the youth outwearied thus. I do beseech you, make an end of this, or must I fly the place and leave you to your tears? Affrighted then, said Salmachus, to you I freely give, good stranger, here remain. Although she made fair presents to retire, she hid herself, that from a shrub-grown covert, on her knees she might observe unseen. As any boy that, heedless, deems his mischief unobserved, now here, now there, he rambled on the green, now in the bubbly ripples dipped his feet, now dallied in the clear pool ankle deep. The warm, cool feeling of the liquid then so pleased him, that without delay he dotted his fleecy garments from his tender limbs. Ah, Salmachus amazement is your mead. You are consumed to know his naked grace." 
As the hot glitters of the round bright sun collected sparkle from the polished plate, your eyes are glistened with delirious fires. Delay she cannot, panting for his joy, languid for his caressing, crazed distract, her passion difficult is held in cheek. He claps his body with his hollow palms and lightly vaults into the limpid wave, and, darting through the water hand over hand, shines in the liquid element, as though should one enhance a statue's ivory or glaze the lily in a lake of glass. And thus the naiad, I have gained my suit, his love is mine, is mine! Quickly disrobed, she plunged into the yielding wave, seized him, caressing him, clung to him a thousand ways, kissed him, thrust down her hands and touched his breast, reluctant and resisting his endeavors to make escape, but even as he struggles she winds herself about him, as entwines the serpent with the royal bird on high holds in his talons. As it hangs, it coils in sinuous folds around the eagle's feet, twisting its coils around his head and wings, or as the ivory clings to sturdy oaks, or as the polypus beneath the waves, by pulling down with suckers on all sides, tenacious holds its prey. And yet the youth, descendant of great Atlas, not relents nor gives the naiad joy. Pressing her suit, she winds her limbs around him and exclaims, You shall not escape me, struggle as you will, perverse and obstinate. Hear me, you gods, let never time release the youth from me. Time never let me from the youth release. Propitious deities accord her prayers. The mingled bodies of the pair unite and fashion in a single human form. So one might see two branches underneath a single rind uniting grow as one. So these two bodies in a firm embrace no more are two. But with a twofold form not man nor woman may be called, though both in seeming they are neither one of two. When that Hermaphroditus felt the change so wrought upon him by the languid fount, considered that he entered it a man, and now his limbs relaxing in the stream he is not wholly male, but only half, he lifted up his hands and thus implored, albeit with no manly voice, Hear me, O oh father, hear me, mother, grant to me this boon, to me whose name is yours, your son, whoso shall enter in this fount a man must leave its waters only half a man. Moved by the words of their by-natured son, both parents yield assent. They taint the fount with essences of dual working powers. Now, though the daughters of King Minyas have made an end of telling tales, they make no end of labor. For they so despise the deity and desecrate his feast. While busily engaged, with sudden beat they hear resounding tambourines, And pipes and crooked horns and tinkling brass renew, unseen the note. Saffron and myrrh dissolved in dulcet odors, And, beyond belief, the woven webs dependent on the loom take tints of green, Put forth new ivy leaves or change to grapevines verdant, there the thread is twisted into tendrils, there the warp is fashioned into many moving leaves. The purple lends its splendor to the grape. And now the day is past, it is the hour when night ambiguous merges into day, which dubious owns nor light nor dun obscure, and suddenly the house begins to shake. And torches oil-dipped seemed to flare around, and fires aglow to shine in every room, and phantoms feigned of savage beasts to howl. Full of affright amid the smoke halls, the sisters vainly hide, and wheresoever they deem security from flaming fires fearfully flit. And when they seek to hide, a membrane stretches over every limb, and light wings open from their slender arms. In the weird darkness they are unaware what measures wrought to change their wanted shape. No plumous vans avail to lift their flight, yet fair they balance on membraneous wing. Whenever they would speak, a tiny voice diminutive, apportioned to their size, in squeaking note complains. A dread the light they haunt, avoid by day the leafy woods for somber attics where secure they rest, till forth the dun obscure their wings may stretch at hour of vesper. This accords their name. Oh, 
Oh, nerds, nerds, nerds. I How I do love to read aloud. It's just my favorite thing, especially that you all enjoy hearing straight readings of the sources. If you didn't catch it too, those ladies were just turned into bats. It's pretty badass. As much as it's a bummer that we have to use these old stuffy translations that have a healthy serving of, of misogyny, though less so in this section, uh, that hermaphroditus bit is bad. Oh, Salmacus, you are a problematic lady. Whew. Anyway, you still get the essence of the works, and it's an amazing way of taking in these stories and poems. So thank you for listening to them. I love them. And as mentioned last week in and in episodes you've already heard, if you are keen to read Ovid's Metamorphoses yourself, there's a new translation that you should be reading. It's by Stephanie McCarter, who was on my show a little while ago to talk about how she went about translating it, and I even read, read a little bit of it. It's it's great. It's good and modern and readable, and most importantly, it was translated through a feminist lens, i.e. just, you know, trying to be aware of the misogyny and look at the stories through a lens of simple equality. What a concept! So yeah, if you want your own to read, go get that one. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians. She handles so many podcast-related things, from running the YouTube to creating promotional images and videos, to editing and research. Whew. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. The podcast is hosted and monetized by Acast. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron, where you'll get bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com or click the link in this episode's description. I am Liv and I love this shit very much, like how could I not, you know?